This is part two of our interview with David J. from Bauhaus. If you want to see part one first, the link is right above my head. Make sure you click subscribe so that you catch the comedy videos we made with him as well. They're really great. Did you ever play a double bass or like an acoustic bass? I've attempted to wrangle that. It's got to be a whole different beast. beast. It's a very different animal. All we ever wanted was everything. It sounds to me like an acoustic bass. That's why I asked. What that, that is is a cello. I'm playing the bass line <gasps> on the cello. Oh, that's if pardon my expression. That's sick. <laughs> okay, hold on. Did you guys ever see this Peter Cetera video when it came out? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I remember that. Uh what did you guys think about that when you saw that? That must have blown your mind a little bit. Um such a strange yeah it's just, it was a surprise you know uh it was also a surprise when uh who, who's the other band uh, new kids Boys. yeah new kids on the block yeah and I, and I don't know if that was down to the stylist or or them kind of like stephen blickenstaff's cramps cover art you know it became the, an emblem of something something people used to signify something when they wear it yeah one that pleased me most was a, a photo of tricky wearing the a, uh, Bella Lugosi t-shirt and I know that's a genuine uh, really early gig in, in Bristol where he's from I was told this by um, Rob Danaja from uh, Massive Attack that um, that they went together to see Bauhaus play it was when we were opening for magazine in uh, 1981 I think it was um, anyway they were they were in attendance and they had a post-punk band at the time and they saw us and were pretty much blown away. And they really also loved that they picked up on what you picked up on, that we were using dub elements. But we weren't trying to be like cod reggae. We, we were genuinely influenced by that and we're taking it on board and using it in, in our own way. So they were Absolutely. Very yeah, and he said that, that, that actually that gig was the start of Massive Attack. And he was there. He was there with Tricky. He was sixteen at the time, and um, they went back and kind of reinvented their band, and that band became wow. back. So that was great to hear that. You know, last time, and last time they played in L.A. here at the Palladium, I went to see them, and they played a cover of Bella. I would. Lo- is that is that available? Like, I'll have to look that up. It's There's probably available. Clips of it online. Yeah. Um, so speaking of the dub Bauhaus thing, when I was thinking about it, I looked at this. You ever notice that they're like sort of similar logos? That's never never really occurred to me, no. I, I mean, it's, it is obviously just a coincidence, but I thought it was kind of funny. Well, it was on the radio a lot. This is like 1970, 71, when I was about 13. Um, but I really heard it when my friends and I used to sneak into a skinhead disco. And that's all they played exclusively reggae, but played it really loud in the dark, massive speakers. And these were tracks that came over directly from Jamaica. And you could only hear them in a place like that. And so that was incredibly potent, you know, to sit, hear that music in that context. And Trojan, Trojan was the label that sort of popularized it in England because there's a huge. Uh, West Indian community, you know, like West Indians came over in the 1950s and then they had their their offspring who um, by the time we got to the 70s had uh, got into Rastafarianism, you know. So, mm-hmm. that was, and that was, like I say, it was big in Northampton and Daniel and myself and Kevin would go into the the Rastafarian events, the sound systems that they had in the town center, which would go on all night. And um, that was also an incredible experience to be exposed to that music there. And they'd have toasters, the guys, you know, kind of rapping in a way. Um, over yeah, yeah. Instrumental dub plates, they called them. And they would put the echo on and trip it out and make it dubby. And uh, it was a great, great scene. And we were like, we were the only white guys in there, literally. And also, the bass lines are incredible. Uh, in, oh, yeah. You know, a huge part of it. Yeah. Shaking through your whole body. So speaking of that, being in a club and the music engulfing you, The Hunger. I have to ask you about The Hunger because right. I love that movie. And David Bowie, obviously, is a 
was that incredible to be working in the same space as him? Oh, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, because he's such a, a huge inspiration. I mean, I made you, you know, idol. Yeah, that was a great experience. I had a wonder, wonderful um, experience with him personally when we were, there was a, they were taking a break to set up the next scene and he was in his dressing room getting ready and our little space was uh, just adjacent to his room. And in our space, there was a, a great old, well, it's a jukebox. It was stacked with all 50s, 60s, and 70s singles. And I was just there on my own. Everybody else had kind of dispersed. And I was just looking at the at the tracks, deciding what to play. And then I, I became aware of this looming presence over my shoulder. Oh my uh, very strong vibe. And then I hear, I hear a voice. Do you mind if I pick one? And it was Bowie. So I say, you know, please. <laughs> And then um, he played this track, Groovin' with Mr. Blow, by Mr. Blow, an instrumental from 1970. And uh, just started dancing in front of me, just like full on, you know, arms in the air, you know, just, I'm just smiling, that smile. And it was very He was dancing I, with you. Well, I was, was uh... yeah, well, I was just nodding. <laughs> and he was oh. full on dancing to me kind of thing. And then I got really cheeky and I said to him, this reminds me of something. He goes, oh, yeah, what? And I said, it's one of yours. He goes, what? I said, it's off the low. He goes, well, what? And I said, um, a new career in a new town. Because I'd always, when I heard that low, the first thing I thought was when I heard a new career in a new town, he's cribbed the harmonica melody line from Grooving with Mr. Blow. I just thought that. So I, I posited this idea, and he goes and carries on. <laughs> it was confirmed. oh my, it was confirmed. Well, I'm not supposed to be saying anything about it, but I already have, and it was a, yes, that was a wonderful experience. Yeah. But then I watched the scene yesterday, and only the freaking tip of your guitar shows up on screen, which kind of stucks. I I, I remembered my memory was was altered. I guess Here it is. I thought the whole band was shown. There it is. <gasps> it shared it shared the screen on the hunger. Well, yeah, and it, that was funny because uh, we. Daniel, Kevin, and myself went to see The Hunger in a regular cinema in, in London in, when it came out. We didn't go to the premiere or anything like that. And uh, we're on the way to the cinema, we were we were saying, I bet we're not in it. I bet, you know, when they were filming us, they were, they were just like, there was no film in the camera, and it would be all Murphy. And <laughs> sure enough, Daniel gets, Daniel gets a couple of seconds, but the rhythm section don't get the bloody look in. Uh huh. Nope. Not at all. No. But you got to hold the whole song together. <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah. It's a thankless task, Dennis. It really is. You and your brother Kevin are both accomplished musicians. Does music run in your family? And like, how did you learn how to play? Uh, my mum uh, had a real good ear for music, and she could pick out any any melody on the piano. She was never taught to play it. She did. That was just a a natural ability she had <clears throat> and her, on her side of the family yeah her well my great great aunt was a concert pianist so it does run in the family to that degree yeah many people describe Bauhaus's sound as being somewhat timeless why yeah. do you think this is the case and what explains its persistence it's an I interesting question because we did not adhere to the styles and mores of the time, we just sort of um, ploughed our own path, and we were just we were outside of time. We were outside of the eighties, you know. We didn't or yeah. late seventies. We were just in our own world, and we were. You transcended genre. I have to say, you did in a sense. Yeah. Um, like some of the best artists, you know, you don't sound like you're from a specific time. Or, pl or place, really. Or place, right. We were just trying to please ourselves. We were just trying to yeah. reach for something 
the exciting as ourselves you know all right his final one is how does song creation work for you we talked about this do you, a little bit do you find it easy to make songs or is it hard work it's not hard work at all um and i never i never force it i never try to write a song never try it never do that um it just comes you know just you having life experiences and it, you're taken on board you're you're perceiving these experiences through an, a poetic lens if you like and then uh, there's a sort of gestation period and then it just sort of bubbles up like the lyrics that Bella did. And my, my, my personal songs, solo songs have become increasingly more personal over the years. Um, but it's the same process. It's just experience, gestation, and release. And I always write the lyrics first. And then the music comes very quickly because the meter and the rhythm of the words suggests the, the music. And also the you know the mood of the mood of the words suggests the chords whether it's minor major whatever. So, but it's very natural. Okay. Thank you so much for the music, dude. I really appreciate it, and and thanks for taking the time to talk to me. Thank you, Dennis Ball. All right, peace Adios. out.